Channel 5 presents Roll. The nationally prominent author and social commentator, Howard Whitman. What is the danger point in social drinking? That's Probe's top story for tonight. Is the business lunch martini leading us down the soggy path to alcoholism? And what about the growing custom of shoving a drink in your friend's fist the moment he enters your house? The slogan of another generation of Americans was quick on the draw. Today's slogan seems to be quick with the drink. Well, it's doubtful if anyone in the USA knows more about alcoholism than Dr. Leon Greenberg. He is director of the Laboratory of Applied Biodynamics at Yale University, the founder and present overall head of the famed Yale Center for Alcohol Study. We'll want to learn from him whether social drinking is harmless or dangerous, and if dangerous, how and at what point. But Dr. Greenberg is not an alcoholic. A skeptic might ask, were you there, Charlie? So we'll probe the subject also Charlie, who was there. This gentleman, Mr. A, is an alcoholic. Now, he isn't ashamed of it, but not everybody understands. Hence, we won't show him completely. We'll hear more of him, even though we don't see more. The United States has the highest known rate of alcoholism in the world. France second, Sweden third. Dr. Leon Greenberg, how do you explain our dubious distinction in the international drink statement. Well, Howard, it, it certainly is a dubious distinction. Uh, certainly, we have at present no explanations uh, based on what we might call physiological uh, cause for difference. Uh, as far as we know today, this difference is due to uh, primarily to cultural differences, differences, uh, differences in the attitudes that the people in different cultures have toward drinking, uh, the customs they have uh, that make drinking acceptable in certain ways and under certain conditions. Are you saying, Dr. Greenberg, that drinking is more acceptable in our culture than in cultures around the world, and hence we do more of it and have a higher rate of alcoholism? Well, certain, certain types of drinking and certain quantities of drinking, and drinking under certain occasions are different in our culture than they are in another culture. Well, let me give you a few occasions. For example, uh, there's the club car in the train where drinks are lavishly served and consumed. The commuter train through Connecticut uh, carry bar cars. There's the cocktail party uh, that is connected with so many business events in New York, and of course, the business lunch. Now, is this the place where we encounter more alcohol and hence more alcoholism. Well, I think you've described a very uh, characteristic segment of American drinking and drinking custom. And uh, this, this is, these are the places where uh, a great deal of drinking is done. Okay, then we come to the crux of the matter. We are trying to pinpoint tonight the danger point in social drinking. Now, how does one know if in the bar car on the Haven Railroad or the cocktail party in Manhattan or the business lunch, how does he know if he is in danger of falling down the steep step of alcoholism? Well, I, I would say that at, uh, at the present time, our knowledge, uh, the danger is never recognized until uh, uh, the uh, catastrophe sort of occurs. When the drinking of the individual has progressed to the point of uh, producing harm or injury, to the drinker, either this is alcoholism. This is alcoholism. That's that. This is the way uh, I would define alcoholism: uh, drinking to the extent that the individual uh, is hurt, he's harmed, he's hurt either physically, he's hurt socially, he's hurt economically, or all of that. And it's only when when this occurs that he knows that he's in trouble. Well, now let's be specific. How is the man going to know? when he is hurt physically by drinking? Well, he, uh, he might sense that uh, he doesn't feel well, he has certain physical disabilities, or he might be told this by, by his physician. Now, what about the, the social harm? He's hurt socially. How? 
Well, he, he, he made his relationships uh, in his community with his uh, social uh, associates and his family on his job. Uh, now, well, now, he may be heard. We're he in the economic uh, category. We speak of his job. That's that what you the mean? economic. That's correct. He loses his job. He loses his job or he gets into difficulties with his superior, with his boss, with his job. Well, now, uh, Dr. Greenberg, you folks at Yale have studied alcoholism for 20 years. Can't we tell the potential alcoholic something about the danger point before he runs smack into it? Well, uh, we can. We can tell the alcoholic. Uh, he may not recognize it himself. We can tell him from certain characteristics of his drinking behavior that suggest that this behavior is now deviating from the normal pattern of drinking. And is he then going drinking. to uh, correct and mend his ways? Uh, probably not. Uh, he'll alibi himself. Uh, he'll express the uh, peculiar behavior that you may be describing in him. He'll express uh, an alibi for this. It's somebody else's fault. It's the boss's fault. Or it's his wife's fault. One more question, and I think this is very important. With social drinking as prominent as it is, what are the chances of any particular individual becoming an alcoholic? Well, Howard, I think that uh, probably the, the best way of arriving at some estimate of that chance is to take the figures that we are aware of today. Uh, there are in this country uh, today about 70 million people who drink. And there are about four and a half million problem drinkers or alcoholics. So that this would, uh, this would uh, add up to a ratio of about one alcoholic or one problem drinker in every uh, uh, 15 or 17 uh, people who drink. Yes. Well, thanks, Dr. Greenberg. And we'll be back to clear up a few points with you later. A man doesn't become an alcoholic overnight. And he doesn't remain an alcoholic without pain. Nor does he become a sober alcoholic without heroin. Mr. A has been an alcoholic for 25 years. He has been a sober alcoholic, a man who has kicked the bottle for four and a half years. Question, Mr. A. Were you ever a social drinker? Yeah, I didn't think I was. You mean you could take the convivial drink without going overboard? Yes. Yeah. Why couldn't you remain a social drinker? What happened? Well, that, of course, I don't really know. I, as far as I can tell, I believe that alcoholism, at least with many people, is an expression of a neurosis. I think it's a compulsion, and I think the compulsion reached the point where I had no control. How did you know it had reached that point? Well, I didn't face it for many years. And I, so that I didn't realize that it reached that point, I think, until I was ready to face the problem. When was that? That was in 1953. What happened that made, that made you face the problem then? Well, I don't believe there's any one single factor that makes a person face the fact they're an alcoholic. It, it's where there were a series of factors. There was the problem of, uh, I think, job threat to a certain extent. My home had been broken up because my wife would no longer take the alcoholic. Uh, people had begun to tell me that I was drinking too much, and I myself suddenly realized that I no longer could control alcohol. This happened almost overnight when I faced that. Well, that was just five years ago, and yet you had been an alcoholic for a good 20 years before that. That's right. Now, what happened five years ago that made you did you hit rock bottom? Was that what it was? Well, I suppose I hit my bottom. That's one phrase. I didn't hit rock bottom in the sense of skid row. Uh -huh. And you abruptly made a change to sobriety. I don't think it was exactly abrupt. I think it was gradual. I think the realization was sudden, but not the change in itself. I think this was a thing that developed over a period of time. I'm not at all sure that alcoholism with the alcoholic isn't in itself a sort of a blackout. That is the inability to face the fact that you're an alcoholic until something happens and then you face it. All right, now we're looking, remember, for the danger points in social drinking. You were a social yes. drinker. 
That's correct. From that, you became an alcoholic. Yes. Now, what are the danger points as you see them? Well, I think that when you go to a party or go out with the intention of taking one or two drinks, and after you have the one or two drinks, you feel just fine and see no reason why you should stop, so you go on drinking. And I, I think there may be many reasons why you should have stopped that night after two drinks. Well, isn't that quite a common experience for people who aren't alcoholics at all? I don't think so. Not if they have something really very important to do that, that should control, that, that they should not drink after the two drinks. I think they don't. Oh, you're saying that the individual doesn't want to drink. That's correct. He desperately resolves not to. He is determined not to when he goes. But with all his willpower, he cannot resist drinking anyway. That's right. And you would call that one of the danger signs, then? I would call that the essence of the danger sign. So that we can nail that down, specifically. I would when say a man so. desperately doesn't want to drink, but has a compulsion that forces him to drink anyway. Yeah. Are, there other are there other danger signs, say, that have to do with a man's drinking habit that indicate he is ready to go off the deep end from social drinking? I think if he has to have cocktails every day at lunch, I think that if he takes the morning drink, I think these are all danger signs in relationship to the drinking pattern. These are not the sort of things that non-alcoholics do. And then, of course, I think if the man has enough awareness, he would realize that the social drinker has no guilt about it. He doesn't awaken the next morning, keeping his eyes closed, trying to wonder what he did and said the night before, what kind of trouble he might have gotten into. These things don't happen to the social drinker. These only happen to the problem drinker. You speaking now of the hangover? It's more than a hangover. Yes, it is the hangover, but often it's the hangover after a blackout. All right, let's talk about the blackout first. Uh, the, uh, the blackout is, uh, I believe, technically known as Korsakoff syndrome, an experience that the alcoholic may have of failing to remember what happened the night before when he was under the influence of liquor. It's the failure to remember. Yes. Now, is this, a, is this a hallmark of alcoholism, or does it happen to all drinkers? I think it does not happen to all drinkers. Have you had this experience severely? Many times. Can you describe yeah. it? It's very simple. You uh, might be at your home and having guests for dinner, and uh, uh, you're there all evening, apparently acting normal, but the next morning you don't remember what happened, say, after you had your second or third martini. You have no memory at all of what happened. Or you may have flashes of memory of a moment or, two, uh, or so during the course of the evening, but to all intents and purposes, the event didn't occur. Is this rather frightening to have uh, experienced uh, events and not to be able to recall them at all? It's very frightening, especially in human relations. You lie there in the morning filled with guilt. You wonder why you, what you might have said or done. And uh, I might add, that under some circumstances, you often do things that are very embarrassing both to you and to the person to whom they were done. Now, what about the quality of the hangover? Uh, is the alcoholic's hangover different from the hangover of somebody who has just imbibed too much at a party? I think so, because, again, I think the guilt enters in there, and the guilt exaggerates very greatly the personal reaction. I think it differs a great deal with, with different people, but the true alcoholic suffers intensely. Well, thanks very much, Mr. A. It's been both kind and, I would add, brave of you to have been here with us. We turn back now to Dr. Greenberg to straighten out a point or two. Uh, first, let me ask, you, you heard what Mr. A had to say. Yes, I did. Did you agree with his description of the danger point, the point at which the drinker desperately wants not to drink, but goes ahead and drinks anyway? Well, as you are aware, Howard, he's, uh, he has the advantage of having been there. Uh, he, however, he is now talking as a per person who has been there, and he is now looking back at where he has been. Well, is he suffering from some uh, uh, myopia of backward vision? As he seems well, I, I wouldn't call it myopia, but uh, he speaks of the danger signs. He now recognizes them as danger signs as he looks back. But those were not necessarily apparent danger, danger signs to him at the time. It's All right. Drinking. Let, let's put this question to you then. Is there any way that we can in determine in advance which social drinker may become the alcoholic? 
Uh, no, I don't think that there is. There is no, there is no shit test for alcoholics. Uh, we don't know. We don't know whether a person will be an alcoholic until he manifests symptoms of alcoholism. And then he is an alcoholic. One final question about women. Is it true that women are becoming alcoholics in greater numbers than before, and if so, why? Well, they're being recognized. Their noses are being counted more efficiently. Uh, I think that perhaps this is uh, uh, the basis for the uh, common belief that uh, women alcoholics are becoming more prevalent. They're just coming out into the open. We're beginning to be able to recognize and to count them. Thank you very much, Dr. Leon Greenberg. We set out to probe for the danger point in social drinking. Dr. Greenberg tells us it's the point at which the drinker is harming himself by drinking and yet cannot stop. Mr. A, the alcoholic, tells us it's at the point at which a drinker desperately wants to stop but goes on drinking anyway. And so the expert and the alcoholic have helped us on probe this evening. In a word, they've told us that the danger point in drinking arrives when drinking is no longer done merely for conviviality to help social enjoyment, but when drinking becomes a necessary psychological crutch, a kind of medicine, a drug. And at that point, for some, it is poison. What they need is treatment and help. Neither is to be found in a bottle. Pro, take two. Most interesting people. Yes, we know the spellings backwards. You'll see why in a moment. As a newspaper man, the saying goes, you meet the most interesting people. You sure do. And we'd like you to meet one of them now on Pro. Here is Mr. John Sperry. He's a well-known New York attorney but he has a special talent, a hidden talent, which doesn't come out, we hope, in the courtroom. Mr. Sperry spells words backwards. That's right, I've heard him spell words backwards much faster than most people can spell them forwards. Now, he's never done it on television before, but he's willing to try. John Sperry, I'm going to pick a few words at random from the dictionary and ask you to spell them backwards. Are you ready? I hope so. Shall we try? Yes. All right, here we go through the pages of Webster. Congratulate. E-T-A-L-U-T-A-R-G-N-O-C. Here's a tough one. Extemporaneous. S-U-O-E-N-A-R-O-P-M-E-T-X-E. -E. I'm impressed. One more. Partnership. P-I-H-S-R-E-N-T-R-A-P. -E well, now... Mr. Sperry, I trust you've been spelling those words correctly, but frankly, I can't say because you've spelled them so fast that I haven't been able to follow you. Do you mind if we check up? No, I don't. Well, here's how we propose to do it. We've chosen a few words in advance, and we've prepared slides to show them on the screen backwards. Now, you won't see them, but the viewers will, okay? Yes. All right. The first word is manifest. T-S-E-F-I-N-A-M. The next is alphabet. T-E-B-A-H-P-L-A. -E next, orchestra. A-R-T-S-E-H-C-R-O. And next, anonymous. S-U-O-M-Y-N-O-N-A. Now, as I have followed the spelling, Mr. Ferry, it has seemed 100% correct to me. But we'll leave it to the viewers. If you've made any mistakes, I'm sure we'll all hear about it in the morning, and I'll forward all the letters to your office. By the way, can you say your ABCs backwards? I think I can. From A to Z? From Z to A? Yes, that's right. Shall we try? Yes. Go ahead. Z Y X B U T S R Q P O N M O K J N H D F E D C B A. Quite a remarkable hidden talent, Mr. John Sperry. Let me ask you this question. How did you discover the talent and when? Uh, I discovered it. I remember during the Harding Cox election. That was in 1920. I had been to the theater and saw somebody do some 
extraordinary uh, work with or demonstrations with figures and of course I can't do anything with figures and it occurred to me that I could apply that to letters and I realized at that time for the first time that I could do it by just envisioning the word backwards well that's the idea you see it backwards that's right then you stall what you see that's right do you have to practice no I don't practice that you also know many foreign languages right that's right how I'm, many oh I can read about eight or nine but I speak about six well backwards well I can spell the words backwards but uh, it's a question of spelling them in those particular languages that's a problem well I thanks mean, I can do it in English of course I can tell you instantly when a word is spoken how many letters are in it I wish we had more time to go into the foreign languages I'm afraid we'll have to invite you back on probe and try some foreign language spelling backwards thanks for being with us this evening Probe, take three, turn about. The critic criticizes. In the world of fine arts, plays, books, TV, these days are being called the heyday of the critics. Critics can and do go to work on the creative output of the nation with good sense and discernment, also with hammer and tongs, and sometimes with meat axe. Holly Burnett has had the meat axe treatment. She is the author of a new novel entitled The Brain Pickers. It is the story of unsavory goings-on in the publishing business itself. Time magazine called it a shoddy novel, concluded its review with this wing of the act, quote, nothing The Brain Pickers says about the U.S. publishing business is as damaging to it as the fact that this book found a publisher at all, unquote. Now, how do you feel about that statement, author Hallie Burnett? Well, I had a fairly lighthearted reaction to that final line. I think that was an unpublished novelist who has a drawer full of novels he can't get published, and um, he rather resents this book being finding a publisher. You mean this was Sour <laughs> Grapes review? Yes, I think it could be said. As a matter of fact, I didn't see that review at first. A friend telephoned me about 9 o'clock that one morning and said, Brace yourself, Hallie. There's a review of the Brain Pickers in Time magazine, and it's going to be awfully bad for your ego and awfully good for sales. I don't think that it's been that bad for my ego, and I'm afraid it hasn't been that good for sales. Well, you know, the Time critic called your book shoddy. The New York Post critic called it cheap, vulgar, the patent place of the book business. True or false, Mrs. Burnett? I haven't read patent plays. Uh, I don't think that I can possibly answer uh, that accusation. Uh, I think that my publishers have uh, publicized it to, as, as a novel to take the place uh, of Peyton Place. Uh, it's not a partic particularly an expose. It's a is story it a, about people. Yes. Is it a dirty book? No, I don't think so. A friend of mine said, you know, uh, if this book had been about a uh, ship at sea and a uh, sea captain, people would have been crazy about the book. The trouble is, it does strike home. You have, possibly by accident, hit on things you didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about people who are in a position to object to this book. Uh, I think that if we can go back to Time magazine for a moment, mm -hmm. uh, there is a sequel to that. I, uh, knowing I was going to be on this program, I telephoned Time Magazine last week about some letters that had been sent uh, to me. One letter was by a newspaper man, a, a Pennsylvania newspaper man, who objected to the review. <clears throat> I didn't know the man, never heard of him before, but it seemed to me like a good letter. So I asked um, on the telephone if someone at Time could uh, give me a person who would be in position to explain how they selected letters. And she said, uh, a letter must be both timely and concise. And I said, well, if it's timely and concise, then what? Well, she said, then it must be uh, worth the space. Well, uh, 
finally we got to the point that the real um, uh, point of, of um, selecting these letters was that it be on foreign affairs and um, objective um, things. Because, she said, you must understand our reviews of books and television and radio, all reviews are purely subjective and time doesn't stand behind them. I see. Well, now, we'll move along, Mrs. Burnett. One outstanding literary figure, a connoisseur for that matter, thinks The Brain Pickers is a mighty fine book. He happens to be the author's former teacher of creative writing, also her husband. Put Burnett, as editor of Story Magazine, published the first fiction of William Theroyan, Tennessee Williams, Bud Schulberg, and Ludwig Bellmans. He's edited 25 anthologies, authored three books of his own. Now, teacher, editor, husband, what do you think of the Time Magazine Meat Axe review of your wife's book? Well, <clears throat> in a case like this, I feel for the author. Only an author, any author, knows what it means to sweat out a year, two years, three years in privacy, finishing a book of his deepest experiences, best observations, and clearest insights, and then to come out in public and be smacked down with a flippant, lazy, superficial, or smart aleck phrase. Is that what you think this was, a flippant, lazy, superficial, smart aleck review? No, I think this was more smart aleck and uh, having the uh, audacity of anonymity. I don't think it was criticism, because behind criticism there must be an individual. You mean this was an unsigned review? I, I think all the time reviews are unsigned, yes. You object to that? I think criticism has to come from a personality that uh, can be defined and has a face and a signature, yes. Are you just being chivalrous, or do you really think that your wife has written a good book? Well, I have only three criteria of uh, judging fiction. Is it honest, or is it interesting, say, first? Is it honest, and is it, for want of a better word, artistic? Now, I think her book uh, measures up to every one of those standards. I think it's a very fine novel. I think it's a very honest book, and I think that uh, many publishers, the big publishers, agree with me. The day it was published, uh, the top publisher called up and told the publisher, I couldn't lay this book down. Tell me who is the fat man. Thank you, Whit Burnett and Hallie, too. The critics will always be with us, for better or for worse. Sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong, but one thing's certain always. They keep us on our toes, and that's good. Opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily those of the Dumont Broadcasting Corporation or Channel 5.